Thanks for watching this episode of Today's Homeowner here on YouTube. And don't forget to leave us a like and a comment. And you can share with a friend if you enjoy it and subscribe so you're notified of new videos. Thanks and enjoy the show. You can find some cool stuff for your home in a store like this, but what happens when it's time to install it? This week, we'll show you. Today's Homeowner with Danny Lipford, the voice of home improvement with projects, tips, and ideas to help you improve your home. You know, it's a wonderful feeling to improve your home, especially if you have a hand in it yourself. Well, many home improvement projects start in home centers like this where you may see a dishwasher or a ceiling fan or a special shower head that you'd love to have in your home, but you're really not sure how to start on the installation. Well, we'll show you how to get started on installing some of these items as well as a number of other very common appliances and accessories for your home and we'll show you all the steps necessary to complete some of these projects. And most projects can be completed very easily in the course of a weekend. Now stick around, chances are, some of the items we're gonna be showing you how to install are already on your wish list. Don't go anywhere. A lot of TV designers hate these things. They're constantly recommending ceiling fans being taken out of rooms and replaced with light fixtures. The fact is, homeowners love ceiling fans because they've realized that the fans can save them a lot of money on their utility bills by keeping their rooms more comfortable. Also, there's no problem in finding one that'll suit your style and the decor of your home because there's so many to choose from these days. That's not a problem at all. But how easy are they to install? Well, it is electricity, so we'll say it more than one time in the show that you need to go to the breaker box and turn off the circuit to the fan or any other electrical appliance that you may be working on. Now, it's a little harder to install than a light bulb, but it's really not rocket science. Let's get busy installing the ceiling fan. Once you have the power disconnected from the circuit you're working on, you can begin by removing the old light fixture. All light fixtures will vary in terms of attachment to the ceiling, but if you take your time, you can figure out what's holding the thing up there pretty easily. In most cases, the electrical connections are made with wire nuts. My friend Greg is hanging this fan, and he wants to be doubly sure there's no power to the circuit, so he's checking it with a tester. Always a good idea. He also makes a quick trip to the attic to reinforce the electrical box that the fan will hang on. This is important because the fan will be heavier than the light fixture, plus it will be moving, so we want it to be secure. The specifics of installation will vary from the style and brand of fan you choose, so read those instructions, even if you think it's self-explanatory. Often, the order in which you put things together will affect parts that go on later, so the instructions can keep you from installing the fan twice. First, Greg's mounting the fan base plate to the electrical box before prepping the fan motor. This motor requires some mechanical assembly, but there are also wiring choices to be made. Will the fan and light be operated by the same switch or by independent switches? The instructions should include a wiring diagram that maps out how to set up your fan for your situation. This fan has a great hook to temporarily hang the motor on the base plate while you're making those wiring connections. You'll want these wire nuts to be really snug so that nothing comes loose as you tuck the wires into the housing and button everything up. In most cases, you'll have to assemble the blades first before attaching them to the motor itself. If your fan has a light kit, it will go on next, followed by any housing covers and, of course, globes and light bulbs. Now, you're ready to test it out. Another very easy and popular electrical installation is to change a regular switch to a dimmer switch. Now to select a dimmer switch that's right for the situation you may have around your home, you need to consider how many lights the switch or dimmer switch will be controlling. Now in this case, with this switch, it controls the three lights we have in this little sitting area. Now each of the bulbs are 100 watt, so the three of them together would equal 300 watts. So I needed to get a dimmer switch that would have that type of capacity. In this case, this one had 500 watts, so no problem at all on that. It's always better to get one a little bit bigger than one that's a little smaller than what you actually need. Also, another consideration is whether or not you have a single pole or a multi-pole switch. In this case, I have just one switch that controls the lighting in this area, so it's the easiest to deal with as a single pole. Now, if you have a switch here and another switch across the room, or maybe even a third switch, then you'll need to consider that when you're purchasing the right 
type of dimmer for your home. There's also a lot of different types of dimmers with rotary type switches, push button, even remote control. The ones I like are the ones with a little switch and then the slide control that's right beside it. Now to replace a single pole switch with a dimmer is really very easy. I finished removing the old switch by disconnecting the wires from the screws on either side. This dimmer is set up essentially the same as the switch in terms of the connection, so I'm simply putting the wires back in the same locations on the new device. Don't forget to connect the bare ground wire. The dimmer will work without it, but it won't be as safe. While I check out this new dimmer switch, you check out this week's Simple Solution. It's time for this week's Simple Solution from home repair expert, Joe Truini. Painting tips have always been some of the most popular simple solutions. Joe has a couple fresh ones. Well, these have to do with interior painting where typically you use a roller frame like this. Now this one you can see is brand new and nice and clean. But what happens if you don't clean it after every use, you end up with caked on paint. What happens is the next time you use it, some of these little paint chips can come off onto the new finish. Hey, this looks a little familiar. Yeah, I took this out of your garage. You've, oh, you've, you've okay. been doing a really nice job maintaining that. <laughs> now, here's, here's a nice clean one, and what you want to do is to maintain it and keep it that way is take some painter's tape, which is this blue masking tape, and tear off a length and put it right onto the metal frame itself. Just pinch it over, and you can continue all the way down the handle, but this part is what gets most of the paint spatter in this little area here. And pinch it on, just spin it, make sure it's not preventing the roller sleeve from turning. And that alone, just using that, and every time you use it to clean that off, you have a nice, perfectly good frame. That's a good idea, that's great. And, and with the type of tape that it is, it's real easy to come off later on. Right, because it's painter's tape. Yeah, okay. Now the other tip has to do with using a brand new roller sleeve, which when it first comes out of the pack, you can see, especially around the end, you have a lot of this loose lint. Mm -hmm. And this will come off in the paint the first time you use it, if you don't wet it down and wash it off. So what I like to use is just a spray bottle, it's like a plant mister with water. You just get this good and wet, and then roll off the excess water. You can do it on a clean paint tray or actually right on the wall itself. And what that is, will get rid of all that lint before you put it into your paint. Oh, great idea. Some of the more common installations may be replacing equipment that has seen its better days around your home. Here's a good example. Now, if you have a bath exhaust fan or ventilation fan that's starting to sound like this one, well, it's definitely time to think about a replacement. Not only is it incredibly annoying being that loud, it's probably not ventilating this bathroom properly. And that's so important to take care of all of the moisture in the bathroom and exhaust it through the attic and onto the outside. Well, we purchased a new ventilation fan to take care of this problem. Now this ventilation fan also has a fluorescent light integrated into it, so there'll be a little extra light that we're able to provide the homeowners as well. Now, a couple things to consider when you're buying a ventilation fan. One is the CFM ratings. This is the cubic feet per minute that the fan will move and exhaust through the fan itself, and that will decide, that needs to be determined according to how large your bathroom is. Another consideration is to select one that's very quiet, because certainly you don't want one sounding like that. This one actually has a SONS rating, which is the sound level rating of 1.1. That's what you want to look for, one that's very quiet and one that will be sufficient to move the air through your bathroom. Now, installing a unit like this to replace an existing unit is a lot easier than starting from scratch. We began by covering up the shower floor to protect it from scratches. Turn off the power, of course, and begin removing the noisy old fan. It comes out in several pieces, motor wiring and finally the housing itself. Greg is helping in the attic space above the bath, and he pulls the old housing out from the top side. The new fan-like combo has a sleeker look, but it also has a slightly larger housing. I'm measuring the new housing and transferring the measurements to the ceiling so that I can expand the existing hole in the drywall. The difference only amounts to an inch or so on one side and half inch on the other. In the attic, Greg connects the new fan to the existing wiring, slips the housing in place, attaches it to the ceiling joist with screws, then reattaches the exhaust vent. Back in the bathroom, I put on the remaining trim. This unit not only looks better than the old one, it also is three and a half times more quiet. And because the light is fluorescent, it won't use much power at all. Well, that project really wasn't that hard. It took a couple hours for Greg and me to complete everything, and fortunately for me, Greg handled all of the work up in the attic. But what a difference it's made. The unit's much quieter than the previous unit, and also the added bonus of the light shining down into the shower 
is something the homeowners are awfully glad to have. Now there's something else in your home that may wear out and you may have considered buying one at a home center, but maybe you're just not sure how hard it would be to install. A dishwasher is a lot easier than you might think. With a dishwasher, you'll not only want to turn off the power supply to the appliance, but also the water supply. Usually this valve will be close by like this one inside the sink cabinet. While you're under there, you can disconnect the water supply line and the drain line. The drain line usually ties into the sink drain above the P-trap. Let these two hoses drain into a pan or bucket while you continue working. To disconnect the power, you'll probably have to remove the dishwasher's bottom panel to get to the electrical connections under the unit. Disconnect all three leads and pull the wire out of the dishwasher's electrical box. Now you're ready to take out the screws that connect the washer to the cabinet and pull the whole thing out. Instead of putting the new washer in exactly as the old one came out, Greg is fishing the wire back into the adjacent cabinet where he'll mount a box and wire in an outlet. In some areas, this is a new code requirement that all appliances have cords with plugs. This simplifies matters with the new washer because you can make all three connections, water, drain, and power, before you slide the appliance into the cabinet. Greg's adding a reducing adapter to the water supply inlet so that it will match up with the water supply line we have. He also connects the power cord while the dishwasher is on its side. The new model has a drain line already connected from the factory so the washer is ready to go in. You simply fish the three lines, water drain and power, through the cabinet wall and push the dishwasher into place. Raise or lower the unit as necessary with the adjustable feet and attach it securely to the cabinetry. Under the sink cabinet, the power cord is plugged in, the drain is connected, the water supply is hooked up and turned on. Well, it looks like Greg did a great job on the installation of the dishwasher. It took him a couple hours, and as you can see, it really wasn't that involved of a process, but he probably saved a couple hundred dollars over what a plumber would have charged these homeowners. Now, the homeowners will also realize very quickly that the newer type models of dishwashers are a lot quieter, just like the ventilation fan we showed you earlier, and it'll use a lot less electricity. Now, hang with us. We're headed back to the home center to check out this week's best new product. Let's join Danny at the Home Center to check out this week's best new product. Brought to you by the Home Depot. Hammers have pretty much looked the same for years and years, but every now and then a manufacturer will introduce one that just looks a little bit different. And that's certainly the case with this hammer from S-Wing. It's called the Weight Forward Hammer, and let me show you why. Now, if you look at the shape of this hammer compared to a traditional hammer, you notice that the weight is a good bit more forward than with a regular hammer. Also, 70% of the weight of this hammer is concentrated at the upper part of it. And if you've ever swung and missed a board and maybe broken the handle of your hammer, you won't have to worry about that one. Plenty of protection for that. Now, because of the weight being concentrated here and the shape of the hammer with the weight being more forward, that gives you a lot more power to drive some of the longer nails. Now, the fiberglass handle is one of the strongest ones um, on the market, and ergonomically, it's nice and correct, so it just has a really good feel to it. And uh, with it having shock reduction values that's part of the design of the hammer um, will mean a lot if you're hammering nails all day long, the fatigue factor won't be near as much of a problem. Now, sizes, they're available in 16 inch and 14 inch handles and 17 and 21 ounce heads and this particular one has a mill face also available in a smooth face as well. So if you're really um, planning on doing a lot of hammering in the future and you want a hammer that's just a little different and a few more features, this might be just the one. Today we're looking at common installations you may encounter around your home and certainly adding a screen door or a aluminum storm door is something that a lot of homeowners consider doing themselves. Now you may install a door like this to protect an opening like we have here from all the weather. You may enjoy the fresh breeze that you're able to get by opening the screen and letting the fresh air in, keeping the bugs out. or you may realize the energy savings you can obtain by using a door like a storm door that'll provide an air cushion between the storm door itself and the actual entry door. But this is just one type. It's a bronze aluminum door that's a fairly traditional, fairly inexpensive, but there's a lot of other options you can choose from. Most home centers have a wide selection of storm doors in a variety of sizes, colors, and prices. Many are set up so that they can be hinged on either side. The instructions will specify how. We're removing the retaining clips that held the hinge frame during shipping. 
Next, I measure the frame against the door jamb before we cut it to length. The opposing latch side is cut to exactly the same length, then we attach the hinge frame to the door itself using the supplied screws. A little leverage goes a long way with these self-tapping screws. This whole assembly mounts to the house, lines up with the door trim, and screws in place from the front and the inside. The latch side frame is lined up on the door before we attach it in the same fashion. The top of the frame, or header, goes on above the frame and latch pieces and is also attached with screws. An extender slides onto the bottom of the door to ensure that it is sealed at the threshold. Then we mount the latch and the closure device to the door itself. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different types of storm and screen doors. This particular storm door has a sliding glass panel that you're able to slide down to different positions with the predetermined notch areas here. And once that's down, you have this whole upper part of it that'll allow fresh air in. It's also kind of nice in case someone pushes their hand against the door, they won't be going through the screen because it's protected by the glass. Now, most storm doors and screen doors have a door closer like this. It's not a bad idea for any exterior door. If you have children around your home that tend to leave the doors open all the time, like it is at my house, well, you might consider a residential door closer. Now, door closers have been used in commercial applications for years, but now they're making them a little more residential friendly looking and will go with just about any kind of decor. Now, whether you have a door like this one that's an entry door or maybe a door leading from your garage into the house or maybe any interior door inside your house, this could really be the solution if you have the same problems I have at my house. The model we've chosen here is brown, so it'll match the dark woodwork on this home, but these units are available in a variety of different colors. A paper template is included with this model to simplify layout and installation by exactly locating pilot holes on the door trim and the door itself. This makes actually mounting the closer and brackets a snap. The closing arm attaches to the pneumatic unit first, then to the stationary arm on the door. A few adjustments to the tension and we can add the housing which makes it blend right in. This was a fairly easy installation, only 15 or 20 minutes, and the cost of the closer less than $40. Now they'll also work on in-swinging doors and just about any interior door that you have in your home. Now if you're not having to constantly remind your kids to keep the door closed, it may be a little more peaceful around your house. Let's head outside for Around the Yard with lawn and garden expert, Tricia Craven Worley. Well, you know, I like ground cover like this Asiatic Jasmine because it can really cover up some bare ground, help on erosion, but it looks kind of blah after a while. Well, blah, 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 right, Danny? Right, right. <laughs> well, here we have some uh, impatience growing, and it's nice to border an area of ground cover with color like that. But, uh, you know, as you said, it's so important, ground cover, the use it has for controlling erosion, mm -hmm. and also at my home, I have it there for controlling the weeds, which oh, are just okay. always It'll out definitely of block out the weeds. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but something else it does is it's just this blanket of nothingness. All right. And there are ways to spice it up. Well, I thought about cutting little areas out, but it kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah, well, I have a really quick way to okay. uh, add some color. All right. Let me get these plants here that I had you pick up. These are Indian summer daisies, and what I'm going to do is simply place them in their pots around the area here. And just leave them in the pots themselves. I guess you could change them out then periodically. Precisely. You can leave them in the pots, and of course, you are probably going to have to individually water them because they need a little bit more oh, than I the see. ground cover. Yeah. Now, what about um, using bulbs? I know you've shown us how to use bulbs in different uh, garden mm -hmm. situations. Would it work in a ground cover? Oh, bulbs in a ground cover are absolutely glorious. The important thing is, to, of course, to put them in the ground at the right time. But when the ground cover begins to die down a little bit, those spring bulbs pop up and they're just beautiful. Well, we've looked at a number of very common installations around your home, but there's so many items that you can buy at the home center that you can install yourself and end up saving a lot of money. Now, I hope we've been able to share some information with you that can help you if you're about to take on one of these projects. But remember, many of the home centers offer installed sales and there's handyman services popping up all over the country. Hey, I hope we see you next week. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Today's Homeowner. And don't forget to comment, like, and hit the bell icon so that we can notify you when new videos are posted.
And don't go anywhere. Click around and continue the home improving fun.